just across the Mississippi River from St. Louis, near the small Illinois town of Collinsville, lie the remnants of an ancient Native American city. It is the resting place of a people who flourished here more than 900 years ago. Their presence can still be seen on this 2,000 acre site. It is called Cahokia. The landscape here is dominated by a collection of man-made earthen mounds. At first glance, they may look just like a few hills along the interstate that runs through the site today. But Cahokia was once the home of the most sophisticated prehistoric native civilization in all of North America. Well, it's an unusual site, uh, mainly because of its size. The number of mounds here is the, the size of the mounds. There's, some, there's nothing like it in North America, North of Mexico. The landscape that Cahokia is located on, uh, really occupation goes back uh, for several thousand years, but it really didn't begin until the beginning of the 11th century. When we get to the mid-11th century, there's a sudden explosion of building at the site, which includes the building of the mounds and the large plazas, and uh, that's when you really get a, a, a very large population that's here that may have been as large as 15,000. What makes Cahokia so much different uh, than these other mound groups that you see in Ohio or in Louisiana that are much older is that you have a melding of a residential population here. You have the dead incorporated within the community. It's not just a, a, a ceremonial center. It's a living community. The peak is the 12th century uh, when you have all this monumental architecture that's present. And then after that, the site begins to, to, to diminish in size. Uh, and so by the end of the 14th century, it's abandoned. The mounds and the, and the other materials that were recovered during the course of our excavations give us insights into the, uh, not only the daily activities of the people that were living here, but also uh, provide insights into their uh, religious activities, uh, certain kinds of pottery vessels that are used to serve special foods. Uh, there are also uh, certain kinds of artifacts that are symbolize authority, certain kinds of axe heads, things like that, that are important uh, to maintaining one's status. Koki is uh, illustrative of, of, of the accomplishments uh, as really uh, approaching what we would call a civilization. Uh, these were very complex societies uh, even though they didn't have what we would call writing, uh, they created the wood hinge. Uh, you know, they're clearly uh, measuring devices, or at least measurements that are associated with that. We've discovered that there are at least five different wood hinges built at this location. This represents the third one in the, uh, the sequence of the five constructions. It would have been a circle 410 feet in diameter with 48 posts around the perimeter. And this would be used as a sun calendar, basically, to observe the rising sun on the eastern horizon. And when the sun lined up with certain poles on the perimeter, it would mark different times of the year. And there are certain poles that align at the equinoxes and at the solstices. And uh, we come out here on the equinoxes and solstices, or at least the Sunday morning closest to those, so we can do observances of the sunrise. And the public is welcome to join us. And uh, we have anywhere from you know, 30 to 130 people, depending on the weather and the time of year. As we look to the east in the distance, you can see Monk's Mound on the horizon. Monk's Mound is not only the largest mound here, it's the largest prehistoric earthwork in the Americas. And on top of that, from excavations, uh, we've found evidence that there was a huge building up there, over 100 feet long, about 50 feet wide. And that is where we believe the Paramount Chief would have lived or at least governed from. This was the seat of power, sort of a cross between the White House and the Vatican, I guess you'd say, with both religious and political authority vested in the leader who lived up here. We're standing on top of Monk's Mound, and out behind me here, you can see a partial reconstruction of one of the stockades or palisade walls that once enclosed the central, about 200 acres of the 
of the city, what we call the sacred or ceremonial precinct, which included Monk's Mound, the Grand Plaza, the Twin Mounds, and about 15 other mounds. And this wall was built at least four times. So it's a defensive wall, basically, because it has these bastions, these like guard towers that project out at regular intervals along the wall. And these would have raised platforms in them where warriors could stand to shoot arrows out against the attackers or catch them in a crossfire between the bastions. So that's why we say it's a defensive wall. But in their own society, it may have also been some kind of a, a social barrier between who got to live inside and who lived outside. So all these flat top mounds would have had some kind of structures or buildings on top. And these were the, the residents of the elite or the temples or religious structures of some kind. And we also see that between mounds or mound clusters, there are often plazas. There's a, a grand plaza in front of Monk's Mound or to the south of Monk's Mound. There's smaller other major mounds around it, but also smaller plazas and courtyards throughout the community too. So you would expect to see maybe hundreds of houses between here and Monk's Mound as we look in all directions. So this was a very densely populated area. I had driven past here um, a lot on the interstate and I saw that there was the, the mounds and it was a big historical site and I wanted, I was really curious to find out what it was. This is a place we, I used to come when I was little uh, before they had steps on the mounds and we used to run up them and down them so when they made the interpretive center I've been here several times. I think it's awesome. I had no idea this was exactly where it was. I didn't know this existed. When people often come here for the first time, many of them are quite impressed. Other people are maybe not quite as impressed because they see them very superficially. They don't put the thought into the human labor that went into their creation. There are no tribal groups or reservations in Illinois or Missouri. So we don't know who the direct descendants of the people of Cahokia are. Those people who have come here, uh, American Indians who have seen the museum and seen our exhibits and things, have been very respectful and, and praiseful of what we've done and the way we depicted the people. Uh, they're, they're used to having seen in the past older museums that emphasize the skeletons and death and things like that and just have rows and rows of artifacts. But here we're trying to show what life was like, you know, how the people lived, the things they made, things they used, from the raw material to the finished product. And, and they appreciate that approach that we take. I think Cahokia is important to people today for several reasons. One, they get to see something they had probably not anticipated. You know, this, the Indians had a city. And most people don't realize that. They're so conditioned to seeing the, the TV and movie images and cultures that are represented on, in those media. They don't often think about the, the prehistoric cultures and how advanced they really were. The fact that American Indians did develop this urban complex here in the middle of the continent and had an influence over probably at least a half of the continent with uh, what was going on here. It's also important to not only just to our country but to the world. A few years ago we were recognized by UNESCO as a world heritage site. These are sites that are felt to be important to all mankind and so that the fact that we were recognized by an international organization as being so important it certainly reinforces our feelings that Cahokia was so important. No one knows exactly why Cahokia was eventually abandoned. It may have been attacks from their neighbors, internal conflict, changes in the environment, or something else. But while the Native Americans who once called Cahokia home have long since disappeared, their legacy of determination, cooperation, and imagination live on in the mounds they left behind.